Bruchem Aboim. Thank you very much for coming. Welcome to our home. Tonight, our uh, lecture, again, we're in the middle of the three weeks. <clears throat> the la name of the, uh, my thought this week will be the loss of family. Sadly, we have all witnessed the tragedy that occurred recently in Surfside, Florida. So many families affected by this event. Why tragedies like this happen is really beyond our pay grade. How can we possibly understand our Creator? We can only say our goodbyes and hope and pray that our friends and loved ones are in a better place. But somehow that doesn't seem to ease the pain, especially for those whose loved ones have not yet been found. I always feel like the greatest loss when someone passes on is to us, those that are left behind. We no longer have a hand to hold, a body to hug, a warm cheek to kiss. We have to rely on memories. Memories help, but can they really replace the person you so dearly miss? You know, the Torah teaches us about all life situations, even if a building collapses on the Shabbat. In the Talmud and the Tractate of Yuma 83a, the Mishnah there discusses the scenario concerning a building that collapses on Shabbat, and we are not certain <clears throat> if there is a person trapped in the rubble. The Mishnah continues and says, and even if we are not sure if they are alive or dead, even if we are not sure if the person is a Jew or non-Jew, they must clear away the rubble to rescue them. If they find the victim alive, then they must continue to clear the rubble. The Talmud clarifies and tells us this is the case even though it becomes evident that the person may only have a very short time to live. We still continue. But if they find the person dead, then they leave the body where it was found until after the Shabbat. <clears throat> One question that is asked in the Talmud is how do we ascertain if the person in question is dead according to Torah law? So the Gemara explains that when examining the person under the rubble to determine whether they are alive or dead, we begin searching from the head. When the rescuers reach the nose and find the person dead, then there's no need to examine any further. However, if they began to search from the person's feet, even if they examined the victim's body up to their navel, or even up to their heart, and they found them dead, this is not sufficient evidence to pronounce them dead. <clears throat> they must continue examining until they reach the victim's nose. As it states in the book of Genesis 7.22, all in whose nostrils was the spirit of life. From this verse, the sages learn out that the nose, breathing, is a decisive factor in determining whether or not a person is alive or dead. From this law that we just stated, we learn that life takes precedence over any of the, any, almost any of the commandments in the Torah, even the Shabbat. Now, our sages tell us that the one mitzvah of keeping Shabbat is equal to keeping all the commandments in the Torah. We were commanded by God in the book of Leviticus in the portion of Achor Emot, 18.5, keep my decrees and laws, since it is only by keeping them that a person can truly live. I am God. So we read very clearly in the, in the Pasuk that God gave us his commandments for us to live by them and not die by them. You know, I call this thought the loss of family. So what is the connection to building collapsing and family? If, God forbid, one of your family members were buried somewhere under the rubble of a collapsed building, I'm certain that you would do everything in your power to save your loved one. Time, money, prayers, whatever it would take even if it meant using your own hands to remove one brick at a time. As long as there was some small hope, even if it was only a glimmer, you would never give up, though the prospects may seem futile. So I wondered, <clears throat> why is it that we only look at the physical being of our loved ones with so much love and hope? Even the Torah not only allows us, but requires us to save the life of a stranger, even a non-Jew. Again, this alludes to their physical bodies. What about dealing with the problems of life that affect our families? 
things like addiction, mental and physical illnesses, different aptitudes, personality disorders, and just being children, especially in these trying times. There are those children who decide that they, that they do not want to accept or follow the religious lifestyle that you have chosen for yourself and your family. They rebel. They refuse to follow your directions and pleas. They become much like a cancer in your house. Then there are those family members that have gone even further and married out of the faith or even converted. So what do we do with these Jewish souls who have been buried alive under the rubble of the secular world and its lifestyle? <clears throat> so do we have the right? Do we have the right to disown them? Do we have the right to walk away? Why should the loss of a physical life be any more important than the loss of a spiritual life, a Jewish soul? After all, the body is finite. It really has no life of its own. Its life force is the soul, that breath of life that God blew into Adam's nostril, the first man at the moment of creation. When that godly soul is removed from the body, its battery, so to speak, then the body is seen as what it was all the time only a vehicle used by the soul while they travel through this world. The only true life in this world is the soul. There are those people who will tell you to disown a child, throw them out of your house, out of your life. But how can we do such a terrible and insensitive act? You know, I had a friend who asked if he could talk to me privately. He seemed very upset. It seems that he had opened one of his daughter's drawers and found a bag of marijuana. He was incensed. First, he decided to talk to me before he confronted his daughter. I looked at him and I asked him, uh, what were you doing when you were her age? He stopped, thought for a moment, and then a big smile appeared on his face. He said, smoking marijuana. He still thanks me for the terrific relationship that he has with his daughter to this day. Why give up on a soul? After all, we don't give up on a body. When doctors give up hope, families don't. Many times they will opt for experimental drugs and even travel to other countries where newer treatments may be available. Souls seem to be cheap. We are much too quick to throw them away. I find it interesting that if a man walks into an Orthodox synagogue and he is married to a non-Jewish woman, and even if he has children from that marriage, most often than not, he will be greeted with open arms and there will be a concerted effort to convert his non-Jewish wife and children to Judaism. However, if the person who marries a non-Jew is a member of that same Orthodox synagogue, his parents may well be advised to cut the child off. They may be told to have no contact in any way with their child. In olden times, and in some communities even today, parents will sit shiva. They will treat their own child as if he had died, chas v'shalom, God forbid. So let's get it straight, okay? If you don't know the Jew who married out of the faith, then you embrace them and try to do everything you can to bring not only them, but their Jewish family as well into the fold. But if you know the person who is married out of the faith, then <laughs> you cut them off completely. There really seems to be something wrong with this logic. When the Talmud discusses how to ascertain whether the person under the rubble is alive or dead, it states if you start searching from the feet of the victim, you do not make your decision from checking the navel or the heart. One must uncover the body up until the nose. Why this order? I believe that these three, the navel, the heart, and the nose, all allude to different criteria for assessing life. The navel, this alludes to the connection that a person has to their mother, who sustained them through the navel while they were in her womb. The rescuers should think about the pain that the mother's feeling and her hopes and prayers that her precious child is still alive. But the navel is not a determination of life once we leave the womb. 
then the next organ that the rescuers reach is the heart. Even though it is the heart that supplies all the blood for the body, the rabbi said that one cannot determine life from the heart. This may be an allusion to the fact that all of our decisions in life need to be made on the basis of logic, not emotion. And even though emotions are important, are an important part of our lives, since they add seasoning to all of our experiences, still, the heart, according to the sages of the Talmud, is not the organ that determines life and death. So what is the organ that determines life and death in a person? The nose. <laughs> really? The nose? Why would the nose be the organ that the sages tell us, indicates to us, whether a victim is alive or dead? Well, for one, life as we know it began when God blew into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, as it states in the Genesis 2 7. And he, God blew into his nostrils the breath of life. So since that which turned a lifeless body into a living human being was a breath of life, when that breath is no longer in the body, then the body reverts back to its original lifeless form. The Zohar, according to Kabbalah, says that holiness enters the body through the nose. It seems that when Adam, first man, ate from the tree of knowledge, the ate Sadas, he tainted four out of the five senses. It says that first she saw the fruit was pleasant to look at. That was sight. They ate from the tree, taste. He listened to her, hearing. She gave him from the tree's fruit, touch. The only sense that is not mentioned in the Torah is the sense of smell. Nowhere does the Torah mention that they smelled the fruit. Another indication that the nose is, is our connection to spirituality and life is the shape of our nose. Our noses are shaped like the Hebrew letter Shin. This is the same letter that we em see embossed on our head to fill in. In addition, we also form the Shin when we place our hand to fill in on our arm. It is no coincidence that the numerical value of God's name of mercy, which has a numerical value of 26, in the Atbash, a Kabbalistic way of counting where we exchange the first 11 letters of the Hebrew alphabet for the last 11 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Then the numerical value, the gematri of God's name of mercy becomes 300, the same numerical value as the letter Shin. For this reason, the nose has remained pristine, untainted by sin. So when a sacrifice was brought up in the temple, it was called a reach nichoach, Hashem, a sweet-smelling savor to God. We also see with Nadav and Aviv, the two illustrious sons of Aaron who died by the heavenly fire that first entered their nostrils. Their deaths were on the level of a sacrifice to God. We see an indication of this by the fact that after their, this fire entered their nostrils and killed them, it then went and consumed the sacrifices that were on the altar and remained burning on the altar until the destruction of the tabernacle at Shiloh, some 400 years later. Even a person, if a person who was convicted by the court of a crime, whose punishment was death by burning, burning in Jewish law is not an external burning, being burnt at the stake. When one is put to death by the Jewish court, by the punishment of burning, the executioner would pour hot lead down the person's throat. An internal, not external burning. So we connect physical death to spiritual life. Once spirituality, the soul, that spark of divinity, has left a person's body, then, then they are dead. This then is the organ the sages tell us. Indicate whether a person is still alive or dead. Now we have a belief where there is life, there is hope. We should never give up. We should never throw a child away. We can learn this lesson from our father Yitzchak. He never threw Esau away. When the Torah in the book of Genesis in the portion of Toldos 25-28 talks about the relationship between Esau and his father Yitzchak, it says that Yitzchak ahav Esau. He loved Esau. And the Torah tells us because he was Sayyid the fifth. 
that he could trap with his mouth. He was a smooth talker. I think the verse is really telling us something completely different. I believe these words are referring to Yitzchak, not Esau. Whenever Yitzchak dealt with his son Esau, he knew exactly who he was. It was Yitzchak who was Sayyid the Fid. He used his wit and wisdom to make Esau the best that he could be. Not all things in life are absolutes, nor are they instantaneous. Some successes are gradual, and some are only appreciated in the context of time. Look at all the righteous descendants that come from Esau. Rabbi Akiva, Unculus, Rabbi Meir, Shemaya, and Aftalion, just to name a few. Yitzchak's efforts were not wasted. In the Talmud and the Tractate of Shabbat, 89b, it states a discussion that God has with the patriarchs. It says that God complains to Avinu, Abraham. He says, your children have sinned before me. Abraham answers God, let them be obliterated for the sanctity of your name. Then God goes, turns to Yaakov and says the same to him. And Yaakov answers much like Avram, obliterate them for the sanctity of your name. However, when God says the same words to Yitzchak, his reply is totally different. When God says to him, your children have sinned against me, Yitzchak says to God, Master of the universe, my children, not yours? Yitzchak says to God, after all, how much could they have sinned? A man lives only lives 70 years, and heaven doesn't punish a person until they reach the age of 20. So that leaves only 50 years. Take away 25 years for the nights when people are sleeping or resting. That leaves only 25 years. Take away half since people are involved in praying, eating, and relieving themselves. That leaves a potential of only 12 and a half years. So Yitzchak said to God, if you take them all on yourself, great. But if not, then you take half, and I will take half. And if you don't even want to take half, then I will take them all, since I have already sacrificed myself before you. The Medra says that Yitzhak finishes up his conversation with God and says to him, I too had a wayward son. I loved him, and you should do the same. If we have the right to throw away our children, then God Almighty has the right to throw us away. We need to know with complete certainty that children, that the children that we have been given, were hand-picked for us. One can ask. We do read in the Torah that Avon Avinu Abraham, our father, does throw his son Yishmael out of his house. True. But the Medrash tells us that Avram still continued to have contact with him. He even visited him at least twice. The only reason why Avram Vino sent his son away was because God Almighty himself told him to do so. We, too, should follow his example. The only time that one should throw a child out of his house is when God Almighty himself tells you to do so. Otherwise, deal with it. More than we bring up our children, we bring up ourselves. When people talk about Yerash Shemayim, fear of heaven, I think that they have the whole idea backwards. Yerash Shemayim is not the fear or better said the awe that we have for God. No. I believe that Yerash Shemayim is the fear, the concern that God, as a loving Father, has for us, His children. He constantly worries about us, just as we, as parents, constantly worry that our children will make the wrong decisions. We know what they should do. Getting them to do it is another story. Our concern for our children is a reflection of God's concern for us, His children. So let us remember that just like we have an obligation to save the life even if it means desecrating the Shabbat. We, so too do we have an obligation to always love and stay connected with our children, regardless of their choices in life. <clears throat> we never, we never have the permission to throw away one of God's children. And with that, may we herald in the coming of Mashiach Tzikainu, quickly and in our time. Thank you very much for listening and for attending. May again, may God bless you with good health and with happiness and success. 
in all that you do. Shabbat Shalom.